So what is port IO according to the Intel manuals? Well, they say that in addition, in addition to transferring data to and from external memory, the processors are capable of transferring data to and from input output ports or IO ports. The IO ports are created in system hardware by circuitry that decodes control data and address pins on the processor, and the IO ports are then configured to communicate with peripheral devices. So basically the hardware understands whether or not there's a particular address pin set that says, hey, this is this uh, you know access that I'm trying to do right now is actually meant for port IO, not RAM. And it says that an IO port can be an input port, an output port, or a bidirectional port. And I think in the future, I really need to update these slides to be more portal themed. So there are two to the 16 possible 8-bit IO ports on the system with port 0 through port FFF. And if you want to access sizes larger than 8 bits at a time, you can. You just basically the hardware needs to support accessing at 2 or 4 byte granularity. Uh, via a port that then essentially takes up consecutive ports. So if the hardware happened to be configured so that port 0 had a 4-byte access capability, it would be port 0, 0, 1, 2, and 3 would all be being accessed at the same time when you were actually trying to read from port 0, and then the next available port would be port 4. And the manual says that when hardware is trying to access these larger ports, like 32-bit ports, they should be aligned to addresses that are multiples of four, for instance. So port zero could be one 32-bit port, port four could be the next, port eight could be the next, and so forth. Now, before you can access the ports using the in and out instructions that we're going to learn about in a second, you have to have the necessary privileges. And it turns out that there's a two-bit I.O. privilege level field in the R flags, which you can't use the in and out assembly instructions unless the IOPL is such that your CPL, your current privilege level, is less than or equal to IO privilege level. So if IO privilege level is zero, your CPL must be less than or equal to zero, so it must be zero. If IOPL is three, then you're good. Three, one, two, they're all capable of accessing it. So this is the IOPL field in the R flags register. It's bits 12 and 13. And so now it's time for a very quick little pause lab. I want you to pause the video, go look at your R flags register, and check what the IOPL bits 12 and 13 is set to. Okay, so what you should have seen is that it is set to zero because most operating systems set IOPL to zero. If they didn't, then user space code would be able to do port IO, and that would potentially allow them to manipulate some hardware that the operating system depends on, and that would cause the operating system to have a bad day. Now, some miscellaneous points is that actually some of the assembly instructions we saw before, we just simplified, things like set the interrupt flag and clear the interrupt flag actually are not possible to be done unless your CPL is less than or equal to the IOPL. So those assembly instructions are actually restricted behind IOPL privileges. Also, in case you're thinking to yourself, well, I think I'll just use popfq to change the IOPL to three, and then I can use port IO from ring three, that's not going to work because it turns out that popfq will not change the IOPL field unless you're already in ring zero. All right, here's the in assembly instruction. And it is something that is restricted most of the time to ring zero. It's not technically, it depends on what IOPL is, but we'll just say it's a ring zero thing because that's how people tend to set it. And there are two forms here. There's one form which takes an immediate 8-bit value for the port which is going to be used for reading in from, and it can read in a byte or two bytes or four bytes. And then there's an other form that uses DX to specify the port, and again, a byte, two bytes, or four bytes. Now, note that this is DX, so this is the 16-bit value, the lowest 16 bits of EDX or RDX. And so that means that this is the only form that can be used to access all 2 to the 16 ports. An immediate 8-bit port number will not allow you to access the upper bytes of the upper port range. Also, the manual says that when accessing the 16 or 32-bit port I.O., the operand size attribute determines the port size. So that operand size attribute was one of those things associated, you know, to help uh, disambiguate for the, dis for the processor. Like if it sees ED, how does it know whether it's 16-bit value or a 32-bit value? That was another one of those things that comes from segmentation. So it comes from segmentation and there's a default size associated with based on your segment uh, whether you have you know a 16-bit segment or a 32-bit segment but there is actually ways to override that so you could access just 16 16 bits instead of 32 bits uh, using instruction 
operand size override prefixes, uh, which we'll talk about later on as some optional material. So paired with the in, there is an out assembly instruction, and it basically has the same caveats as with respect to DX 16-bit value, putting that out as the output port. So if you wanted a 32-bit value and you wanted to output to a 16-bit port address, you would need to use the DX form. Otherwise, you could use the 8-bit immediate port form. The next question then would be, how do you learn about which ports correspond to which hardware devices? And for that, I can tell you right now, one does not simply read the Intel software development manuals. Instead, you have to consult what's called the chipset documentation. And we talk about this a lot more in a lot more detail in Architecture 4001, so I'm just giving you, you know, the briefest of overviews now. But basically, you know, back in the day, there used to be a literal chipset of, of chips on your machine. You had your CPU, you had what was called the memory controller hub, and you had what was called the I.O. controller hub. Over time, Intel then merged the I.O. and memory controller hub and put some of the memory controller hub stuff into the CPU. And then you landed on the CPU and the platform controller hub. And further, as time goes along, things tend to move towards system on a chip where everything is all combined into a single processor. So this is what you tend to see on like laptops and embedded systems, but desktop systems still typically have a discrete platform controller hub separate from the CPU. So then the question is, where do you find in these things the documentation of port IO? Well, back when it was the IO controller hub, you would find what ports correspond to what hardware in the IO controller hub documentation. These days with the platform controller hub, you use the platform controller hub documentation. And if you have a sockish type system or some of the newer, just, you know, it could be a desktop system that just is everything all in one, there will be a thing called the IO data sheet. And in those sort of documentation, you will find things like this, big tables of a bunch of port IO addresses, and they'll tell you, you know, roughly what it's configured to. So this would say, LPC Super IO chip. This says these ports are for the interrupt controller. Uh, this port is not actually really specified in a meaningful way, but I can tell you port 60 has to do with the old 8042 uh, keyboard controller from the original IBM PCs. And then there's sort of the Intel hardware like emulates that capability in newer things. But what we want to cover next is a look into this one. This is the non-maskable interrupt control, which we're going to ignore, and to the real-time controller. So there was a, a bit for non-maskable interrupts that got merged in with the bits for the real-time clock controller, which got merged in with bits for just some arbitrary storage memory. So we'll cover this one in the next section. This has to do with ports 70 through 77.